Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Louis Sheely, and I'm a senior undergrad at Georgia Southern University, pursuing my bachelor's degree in public health. Today, I will be interviewing Leslie Reeves, who is the owner and certified facilitator of Journeys Intervention Strategies here in Chatham County. Journeys is about building pathways to transformation through education and intervention services. The focus area are family violence intervention, anger management, and parenting and child development. I chose Leslie because she is a professional in the mental health field and is offering services for individuals where mental health issues may be an underlying factor and how they engage in their daily interactions and relationships. Good afternoon, Leslie. Hi, Louis. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. So, Leslie, I'm going to share a few statistics and ask a few questions to discuss the impact that COVID-19 had on mental health in the nation, but specifically from your local point of view. So, Leslie, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted or halted critical mental health services in 93% of the countries worldwide, while the demand for mental health was increasing. So what do you think has been done in Chatham County to address the mental health issues or provide mental health care during the pandemic? Well, as you know, uh, Lewis, there have been a lot of services that have been shut down due to the pandemic. But here in Savannah, we have uh, several agencies that were still up and running just to be able to provide support and services to those with mental health needs. For instance, the Mobile Crisis Line, the Georgia Crisis and Access Line, they are still responding to calls. Um, they have been throughout COVID, but they limited um, face-to-face interactions. The Georgia, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, they um, released some of their restrictions so that they were able to provide mental health services through telemedicine. And they, off, they also provided COVID management and self-care um, situations for their providers. Um, there was also Memorial uh, Savannah. They saw an increase in behavioral health situations and all their services were still open Um, including their residential services, but their outpatient services kind of moved to a uh, telehealth situation as well. Gateway, all of their operations continued and they had open access for all of the adults and children alike. And many of the services were um, through telemedicine and it was very much encouraged that a lot of the individuals or um, participants there participate through telehealth. Um, We also have the schools, which I saw was a great um, involvement for the schools where they offered a lot of resources and training for the teachers, Um, self-care training and the resources that dealt a lot with trauma so that they would be best able to deal with the students and also still provide that self-care management that they needed for themselves, recognizing that not only were the children facing crisis, but the crisis that also affected them as, as well. And then we also have uh, the Safety Net Planning Council, which I, um, myself, I really participated in these services, especially my favorite was the Mindful Self-Compassion class. It was an eight-week course that we were able to deal with certain things, be mindful of our situations, and practice that self-compassion and self-care that we needed, especially through this time of crisis. All right. So um, during the pandemic, do you think there was more of a focus on crisis coping or was it more on PPE and hygiene during the pandemic, such as wearing a mask or using hand sanitizer, t- sanitizer or cleaning disinfectants? You said it perfectly from my perspective and, and based on uh, the news coverage that I've seen and even just looking right here in our county, you can see the main focus again from my perspective is wear your mask wear your mask. It's always mainly about washing your hands and making sure that the the disease isn't contracted from person to person. So I think a lot of the focus was mainly on that hygiene and that personal protective equipment that they wanted others to get. The crisis coping, it might have took a back seat. And from especially from a mental health standpoint of view, I think mental health has been masked a long time. So that mental health part where it's been a secret and it's been covered up, the mental health issues that I might be facing or that people in the community might be going through, it has been masked a long time. So because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the pushing of hygiene and where you're masked, I think the mental health was allowed to even be masked even further, even though um, during this 
pandemic, it actually pushed certain things up a little bit more that we were made more aware of certain situations and certain individuals during the pan pandemic. But I think more PPE and hygiene was pressed a lot more than crisis coping during this pandemic. So during late June, 40% of U.S. adults reported struggling with mental health or substance abuse. So my question is, why do you think there was such an increasing trend of individuals reporting struggles with mental health during the pandemic? I think this goes along with the, the previous question where I was saying how mental health has been masked. And I think because it's the it's been the silent um, form of illness that that is not allowed to be talked about. It's not allowed to express whether I'm going through depression or anxiety or even my substance use issues. But I think, however, this pandemic might have begun to pull the cover, per se, off of some of our um issues that we've been struggling from a mental health standpoint um, because we've been around each other more. The way I've coped um, previously to the pandemic is not the same way I can cope due to the pandemic or because we're in the pandemic. So probably before the pandemic, maybe an individual might have been able to take a walk or go to the park and, and have some me time or some alone time. But during the pandemic, because we were all closed in, we were together more and I wasn't able to utilize the same strategy I used to cope. So now I think that's one of the reasons why the the trend of in the reporting those struggles have increased because the way I cope by myself, whether I chose to use drugs or alcohol or whether I chose to, to binge shop or whether I chose to just get to the park, those things were cut down because of the pandemic. So I think now that um, those coping strategies were cut down because of the pandemic. And now that I think because of the pandemic, the cover is coming off. So during the pandemic, um, we know the economy w was taking a hit and a lot of people were struggling. Um, and some people may not have been struggling as much when it came down to funding and paying bills. So there were some stimulus checks released and some COVID release funds relief. So uh, how are these funds helpful during the pandemic and how helpful is this towards the mental health of individuals uh, from a positive standpoint and also from a negative standpoint? From, from what I've noticed here in my community and especially the, the many of the participants um, here at Journeys, what I've noticed is that the stimulus was a, a incentive or an extra benefit because of the pandemic, not a relief due to the pandemic if that makes sense. The the stimulus served as a way for me to be able to, to go get something that I wouldn't have been able to buy prior or take on a, uh, be, begin to splurge a little bit more because of that stimulus. There have been some individuals that the stimic did come as a relief because because of loss of employment, because of my job, they cut back on hours, I was able to get some bills caught up to date. So it, um, in the community and individuals that I've talked to, me being able to pay certain things off or get at least get the past due covered because of the stimulus actually was able to um, decrease stress or anxiety that individuals might have been facing. Um, so it did have some positive and negatives, but from the, the individuals that I've interacted with, you could say it kind of I'm going to just say if I had to give it a percentage, maybe like 60, 40, more 60 to where I can splurge with the money and 40 percent. That really was a relief um, to help with any kind of stress or anxiety or other mental health issues that I faced. All right. And it was stated that even loss of income was a triggering mental health condition or exacerbating existing one. And so a lot of people that were um, triggered by their loss of income, they were facing increased levels of alcohol and drug use, insomnia and anxiety, um, which goes into that mental health and our self-care. So why do you think our mental health and self-care is so important in these times of crisis? When it comes to our, our mental health, it's extremely important to our overall well-being. Um, I think mental health helps us to maintain a balance in our lifestyles. Uh, between work, school, um, family, you know, we have one. We we carry we wear many hats uh, in in our uh, in this day and age. So between work, home, family, school, um, even self, 
there there's a balance that should be maintained and i think mental health really plays a a good part in maintaining that balance so if my mental health is lacking then it's going to really um affect my effectiveness in maintaining those things that I value or those things that are important and how I impact those things. So I think it's very important that the, my mental health is, is maintained from, from more perspectives than just one, not just the perspective of I'm, I'm going through uh, bouts of where I can't sleep, but how is that sleep affecting my ability to cope with situations? And if I have a negative coping pattern, then how can we get that switched around to a positive coping pattern. What I've also noticed, especially in my line of work, the, the mental health, especially when it comes to um, drug use, um, when it comes to frustration and stress, you see a lot more family violence um, related charges and incidents taking place where people are not even being safe or not even practicing safe interactions with one another. So I think that mental health component is very, very important, especially during the common crisis, because it's already like a, um, what's the word you want to say? It's already on edge prior to any crisis taking place because I already have so many responsibilities and, and these things in, that I'm going through life have already been so overwhelming. And then add a crisis to that. Now I lost my job because of a pandemic. Now we're home all day together in the pandemic and we didn't know how to communicate prior to the pandemic. And now it's even worse now that we're in the, in the pandemic. So I think our mental health is very important and Part of us being able to stabilize our mental health is that self-care. My, my, my mental health might not be to the point where I need a professional or I need to go, go out and see someone. But if I maintain my own self-care, if I practice um, the mindfulness that I learned in the class um, with um, Miss Vera if I pra and Miss Jess, if I practice that mindfulness and that self-compassion then I can I can practice things such as meditating so I can clear my mind and I can practice things where I can offer myself that supportive touch and I can practice situations to where um, the, the stress that I'm seeing, I'm not the only one going through that type of stress. So being able to deal with these things and practice the positive self-care, whether it's just sitting in the park or whether it's reading a book or listening to music, that self-care would help to bring and maintain a balance um, at least to the to the part of me that and my mental health that I can manage on my own. Yeah. All right. So so May is actually Mental Health Awareness Month. So what are some ways that we can raise mental health awareness um, in our communities or even in our nation? Um, yes, yes. With, with men, when it comes to mental health, I think one of the where we need to start is destigmatizing um, mental health. Um, of course, again, this is my my perspective and my point of view. But no one wants to be quote unquote classified as crazy. And when we bring up mental health issues, that's automatically, especially with the participants that I deal with, that's automatically where their mindset goes or where their perception of what mental health is. I'm not crazy. It's nothing wrong with me. That's the, that's the first part where our mind begins to believe that mental health, you'll be stigmatized as, as crazy and you have to end up in, in certain um, facilities just to even deal with it. However, we all struggle in multiple areas when it comes to mental health. And of course, I, I list the ones that are that that we deal with on a day to day basis, such as stress and anxiety, and of course that that the common drug use, because a lot of people, of course, many that's their way to cope with the things and the stressors of life. Um, we deal with these mental health on a day to day basis. Not to mention bipolar and schizophrenia, where we actually need more uh, support in dealing with these type of mental health issues. But I think destigmatizing it and getting it more in the community that that mental health is part of our um, overall well-being is part of, of the, the makeup of who we are. Just like I need to be physically healthy, I need to be emotionally healthy. I also need to be mentally healthy. And it, it brings, again, that balance or that triad with my mentality, my emotions, and my, my physical 
well-being to where I can become whole, I can become more successful, and I can be a more productive part of the um, society and the community, even with the mental health issue that I have. If the mental health is addressed properly, if the, the, the mental health, if I'm actually met by professionals or individuals right where my need is, um, I think a lot of times we've we've put mental health like in a melting pot sort of thing. If you, you got bipolar, I have anxiety disorder, someone else um, borderline personality disorder, someone else depression, and they all go into the same pot. But Lewis, how you really do recognize that being able to meet my need isn't going to be able to meet someone else's need. And I think that would, if we get more into the community um, with mental health, what it really is, how it affects us on an individual level and also on a community level, um, especially by destigmatizing mental health, I think we can begin to make more people aware. Um, just going, getting a therapist, Lewis, won't just be a trend. It won't just be something to do because it's part of the fad or, or taking medicine won't just be something to do because this is what my doctor ordered. But I do understand the importance of the therapist and I understand the importance of the medication and why it's important for me to maintain that, that um, the, the um, maintain in me being able to, to do my part in my own mental health. So if the doctor prescribes medication, I'm understanding the importance of the medication and now I can participate in my own mental health by saying, yes, I'm going to take the medication, even though they make me feel one way and the doctor actually understands me and how the medication is working with me. We actually can team up and collaborate for my mental health. Right. And I just want to piggyback off that. And that's really good. Um, and the word I think of is like mental health competency whether that being in our workplaces, yeah. uh, in professional settings, or even in our homes, because a lot of times people, they'll go to the doctor, they'll be feeling a kind of way, but that doctor is not necessarily a mental health professional. And they'll try to, quote unquote, meet that need or give them advice or make suggestions. But that person doesn't need that because they need someone to meet them uh, where they're at or where their mentality is at in that moment. Not like, oh, maybe try this like medication, maybe this will make you feel better. But really, that person really just needs to be in a setting to where they can talk about things or be heard or listened to and, you know, have that dialogue with someone so they can even understand themselves and how they're feeling because there may be those underlying things that they need to recognize or need to be brought to the surface. So I think that's really good. And I guess my next question will be... Before you go to your next question, competency is a is a perfect word. And you just brought back to my attention that, um, as a matter of fact, before uh, COVID-19 and um, before COVID, before the coronavirus and the pandemic hit, I actually took a training uh, with NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental um, Illness. I actually took that training, the crisis intervention training for youth, because it's, it's very important that even our police officers when they come across a situation where they might have received a call um, on someone and they interact with the person, and it, it just might be a mental health episode that the person is going through or some type of crisis, and if, if the, the officer is not competent enough to handle that situation, then the person might end up getting rough handled or hurt because the officer feel like he's not being uh, compliant, whereas it all, it's been a mental health interaction in the first place and to be able to address that mental health act um interaction from a, a place of competency that is a, a good point that you make all right all right so i know you was listed a few examples or a few resources that dealt with mental health um but i guess my question is what are some ways that we can educate more so on the community aspect um uh, on mental health, how can we get the community more aware? Okay, yeah, that's that's a good question, and I do. I just mentioned um, NAMI, where it was this um, crisis intervention training, um, and also there is um, that I know about. There is the assist training, which is the um, a, applied suicide skills intervention training. Um, I also know about the mindful self compassion uh, training, which I took myself. Um, the community resiliency interaction training and also the um, 
trauma sensitive interaction training. These are trainings that I took and I participated in. Um, and they were actually offered, um, Vera Salzburn, she offered a lot of the trainings, but what I've come to notice and recognize is that with the trainings that I listed, which are, which are impeccable trainings, they're excellent trainings to, to be a part of and to take. And I'm very grateful that they're even offered. It's like, a it's training from organization to organization and the training from professional to professional, but we have to figure out how to get the training from a professional to the community so that that training that I get as a professional, the, the certification that I take as a, um, as, a, as a certified facilitator or owner of a program, how do I get that training into the community? How do I educate the community, not just on a mental health itself, but then to be able to address the mental health issues that are in their family or that are in their neighborhood without it just being, um, well, that's not my business, let me mind my business, where it can be to the point where, excuse me, that I'm equipped and that I'm that I'm educated at least to the point where I can offer assistance. Um, I know this kind of a little bit off topic. I know the city of Savannah a while back had offered a CPR training where they took it into the community so that because nine times out of ten the EMS is not going to be there when the person actually needs the help. So they took it into the community so that individuals in the community would be CPR trained to be able to help their family members or their friends in case this response is required. And I think that might be a good strategy and a good tactic to be able to take something like mindful self-compassion into the community or something like the, um, I believe it was a trauma drama course into the community and offer it to individuals in the community so that they can actually practice these things with their family members in case of a crisis or a um, mental health situation comes into play. All right. And it's almost as if people in a community kind of need to be trained to be first responders when it comes to mental health, because you never know what someone may be going through or what actions they're going to take to maybe get out of a situation or um, try to alleviate that situation. And it may not be a healthy way in the sense that you know, we may see it as, or they might even know, but in a sense, if we become those first responders, we could be the first ones to help until more help comes. You yes. Know? So I think that's very, very good. Yes, Lewis, you're absolutely right. I think it's very important that in, in my home, that if, if, if I'm dealing with the mental health issue with maybe my son, it's very important that I can be able to institute or or implement any kind of education that I've that I've come across or any kind of skills like you said until more appropriate help comes and I need to be able to to be trained or to, to be aware of what it is that I can do to if, if my son is going through a, a manic crisis some tilt skills and techniques to be able to calm him down or or get him to the place where he can begin to self-regulate in that situation and 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 I think just just from experience, not from any kind of professional standpoint, but just from experience, I think it's more a more of a calming factor when someone you can trust, especially when you're going through crisis, can be there for you versus a complete stranger coming in um, and you're not even you don't even know who they are and you might even be in denial about your mental health crisis. So I think being able to get that into the communities be able to get that into the homes to where family members can actually be there and be that support that their family needs, especially in a mental health crisis, is very important. Lewis, um, one organization that I'm actually uh, collaborate with and that I've been involved with for the past four or five years now is Parent University. And Parent University is in the community. Parent University offers different um um, sessions and programs and classes that have been able to help parents be better parents to their children, be better parents um, to their to their kids. Um, and they offer, especially during the pandemic, they've offered a wide variety of courses and workshops that dealt with stress, that dealt with communication during times of stress, that dealt with um, 
um, even on the hygiene side, understanding what the vaccine is and why it's required and why it's very important. Also being able to make um, connections with different programs and different organizations for extra resources, um, such as organizations. Um, they're, they're, they're too no, numerous to name, but there have been a variety of organizations that shared their information and their resources that they've still been offering during the um, pandemic. So Parent University has been in the community front line um, and offering different resources and education for parents and for individuals in the community. So Leslie, one thing that COVID-19 has really highlighted is the demand of mental health in our nation. So moving forward, what do you think the future of mental health care is going to look like? That's a good question, Lewis. Um, of course, mental health has always been here. Mental health has already been um, present, prevalent, and around. I just think it's just the way mental health has been approached that night might need be to be addressed. Um, and I think for the future, and I think it might already be heading this way, I think self-care is going to play a very, very, very important part of our mental health. Um, mental health, it is a, it's a personal issue. So I need to be fully invested in my own personal growth and personal well-being rather than just making it the doctor's responsibility. So I think self-care is very important, um, especially my emotional health. Um, stress management. Um, I need to be able to um, understand and be aware of certain changes or um, to society, to environment, so that I can better manage when transition take place. Um, learning positive coping strategies. Um, of course, we, we know how to cope, Lewis, but it's a lot of times it's very negative. But if I learn positive coping strategies, learning new ways to relax, learning new ways to to approach a situation from a from a different or deeper perspective um, and, and have my perceptions being able to justify. And I think a lot of that comes through self-health, self-care, including taking care of my body, being able to connect with others to be able to find that right support, especially when I'm going through something that's a little bit harder today than it was yesterday. Um, taking breaks throughout your day often, not just from work, not just taking a 15 minute break from work, but taking breaks throughout your day, throughout your lifetime, just to even be with yourself, just to be with yourself, be present with yourself in the moment, um, to unwind, to relax, to enjoy yourself, to enjoy your life. I also think it's very important to stay informed about what's going on around you, but pretty much avoid as much negative news as you possibly can. Um, being To me, being exposed to a lot of negativity and a lot of negative news in our nation, I think that tend to tends to lead to more mental health issues and mental health crisis, especially worry and um, higher anxiety rates um, and even um, increased depression. And another way I think, especially when it comes to self-care, when it I'm I'm caring for myself. I'm I'm supporting myself the way I need it, even if that is getting support from you. But I also think it's important in my self care to seek the help when I need it, to seek the appropriate um, and and professional help when I need it. And I also need to recognize when that is in fact the case. So I think when it comes to mental health and the future of mental health, self care is very very important and I think it might be strongly pushed and it is also cost effective Lewis the more self-care that I'm able to practice I'm um, especially being physically healthy being emotionally healthy being mentally healthy I think actually leads to uh, a more a healthier home a healthier family and even healthier communities All right and even like not to look at the COVID-19 pandemic from that negative standpoint that is that is definitely a positive that's come out of it. Being able to look yes, at this sir. and be like, "Hey, mental health care quality needs to increase. We need to we need to do better as a nation uh, to provide quality mental health care and confident mental health care." Because looking at it, you know, just think about what the future is going to look like if people are um, more mentally healthy, more mentally um, 
what's the word stable stable yes sir and just you know a lot of the issues that we have now in our nation just think about a lot of those issues and the rates of those think about crime because even that plays a part you know when it comes to mental health just decreasing rates of just a lot of negative outcomes and things like that and people's negative perspectives or discrimination or implicit bias things like that in our healthcare field so i think mental health has a very bright future in our nation when it comes to healthcare and our professional settings. Um, but that's all the questions and topics I had to discuss. But uh, first and foremost, I do want to thank you for providing your input yes, sir. and uh, providing your perspective and your thoughts on uh, the COVID-19 virus's impact on our mental health as a nation and as uh, professionals in public health or medical health care, things like that. Um, and, you know, we were able to see a lot of things and it brought a lot of things to light, um, you know. So I appreciate you, Leslie. Thank for you for being having here. me again. Thank you. I appreciate being here and you really taking my thoughts and my opinions into consideration in regards to mental health. And so uh, before we, we go today, I do want to just talk about a few resources uh, that are mental health related. Uh, of course, we have our. Georgia Crisis Access Mobile Line. Um, the actual phone number for that is 1-800-715-4225. Um, we have a few resources that uh, Chatham Safety Net actually implements and inter intervents. I know uh, Vera Salzburn teaches a few of these, uh, which is our assist training, which is the suicide first aid training, uh, mindful self-compassion courses, and the trauma drama. Um, also, we have our journeys intervention strategies that are offered offered by Leslie Reeves um, and, and a few resources for facts. And if you want to know any more information, uh, we have our CDC fact sheets where you can look up online through Google search or uh, Windows, Microsoft, whatever you guys prefer. Um, I know the John, John Hopkins Medicine website has a few articles on mental health and also you can find articles on the world world health organization uh website um and also uh the phone number for journeys i didn't uh mention is 912-201-1205 and that address is 221 executive circle suite 7 savannah georgia 31406 uh and the email is journeys i s l l c at gmail.com uh, and Leslie, thank you again for your time. And um, I hope you have a great day. And I hope that <laughs> mental health self-care is something that you will intervene and implement in your future, in your household, in your job, um, and in your, your interactions with people. Yes, sir. Thank so. you very much for having me. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.